Thank you for coming. Can you all hear me? Okay, good. As I said earlier, I'm Dutch, so I, t I, tend, I tend to shout. Um, I will probably talk for about an hour or so. I do apologize for that. Uh, does anyone have to go uh, at three o'clock? Uh, a few people have. Okay, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, um, before I embark on the uh, lecture, uh, first of all, I apologize for the slightly Germanic sounding title there. Um, but first of all, two caveats. Uh, the first one, I think, is obvious. Uh, Trump is not Hitler, but it does need saying, right? So Hitler was a convinced racist, uh, committed anti-Semite, responsible for the Second World War and uh, the Holocaust, in which six million Jews perished. Nothing even remotely similar can be said about Donald Trump. I don't even think that Donald Trump is a convinced racist, although he did play um, deliberately to white nationalist uh, sentiment. Um, so in that sense, the two of them are incommensurable. There are, however, I think, important parallels when it comes to their um, ways of self-staging that I don't have time to talk about today, and their rhetorical strategies, which is the topic of today. The second caveat, I'm not a scholar of linguistics. There are people like Henrike, who can be both literary scholar and linguistic scholar at the same time. I'm just a humble cultural theorist, um, so I won't, do, I, I won't do much close reading, but look at uh, these things as Henrike uh, indicated from a more general point of view, sort of communication theory uh, and cultural studies. The third thing, and this is partly sort of a warning and partly shameless self-advertising, all of this, of course, takes place in a specific social context that I don't really have time to talk about today either. Uh, but this has just come out, and in that book I talk uh, in uh, a little bit more detail uh, about all these uh, things surrounding uh, Hitler's and Trump's uh, speeches, because that's really my focus. Not so much Mein Kampf, not the language of the Third Reich, as in uh, analyzed by Viktor Klemperer, uh, but uh, Hitler's and Trump's speeches and their rhetorical strategies. Available now, I've been told by my publisher, at the very agreeable price of $24.99. Okay. Now, I want you to take four things away from this talk, and the first three are at the beginning of this talk, right? So don't leave immediately afterwards, although you could, because then you would have had three quarters of what I'm trying to say. So this is the first important thing, right? This is how we... This is the popular understanding of Hitler, a loose cannon, a guy who bites the rug on the slightest occasion. That is... Uh, a total misconception of Hitler, right? We see here, when we, when we think of Hitler, we see of, we think of this, the actor Bruno Ganz in uh, Der Untergang, uh, Downfall, uh, Uma, a man who basically just loses it all the time. Hitler was not like that at all, as his uh, architect, personal architect, and later armaments minister, Albert Speer, stressed, one of Hitler's most striking characteristics was precisely his self-control. We know that Speer lied his pants off when it came to his own role during National Socialism, but his picture of Hitler is pretty adequate. It's confirmed by other people as well. Uh, I have some wonderful examples uh, on that uh, for which I have no time uh, today. Same is true of Trump, right? We tend, tend to think of Trump uh, also as a loose cannon, which is understandable, right, for fear of glorifying these people. We tend to see them as short-fused rather than strategic. But they were very strategic people, um, well able to hide their emotions, and if they did get angry, and uh, both Hitler and Trump got angry at regular intervals, that was invariably faked. 
again, it's a shame we don't have time for this, but I've got some, I would have had some wonderful examples on, on that. Okay, so this is the second important thing I want you to take away from this lecture. Hitler and Trump are political performance artists. That means that you've got to see their speeches, their speaking, as political Gesamtkunstwerke. So in that sense, if you want to understand the language of totalitarianism, you cannot just understand the language of totalitarianism. It goes way beyond that. Right? There are pragma-linguistic, social-linguistic categories that are much more important than the actual words. And I'll try and explain that um, during the, uh, the lecture. So, what did Hitler think? What were his key assumptions when it comes to public speaking? Surprisingly, Hitler talks about this very openly in Mein Kampf. And I'll just go through the most important elements here. So this is the first one. What rouses the masses is the spoken word, not the written word. The written word's for intellectuals, and who cares about intellectuals, right? You want to um, get hold of the masses as a populist politician. Trump is a populist politician, and Hitler, whatever else he was, and he was many other things, a genocidal murderer and, and failed military leader and what have you. He was also a populist. And the spoken word, this is the second point, has its own pragmatic criteria. The example that Hitler uses is that of David Lloyd George, former British Prime Minister, who in the first half of the First World War was munitions minister. And Hitler looks at the criticism of Lord George, uh, George and he says, people have said that uh, Lloyd George's speeches were hackneyed, cliched, intellectually inferior, but, Hitler says, as live performances, they were brilliant. And that is what counts. Again, I know I'm going through this at a sort of fairly brisk pace, and I do apologize for that. If I do go too quickly, then please let me know. So I guess from the previous two points, uh, it follows that you've got to address yourself, if you're a populist speaker, that is, um, at the um, lowest common denominator in your audience. And then this is something you are uh, intimately familiar with, of course, then uh, you've got to grab the audience by their emotions. It's not about arguments, it's not about reason, not about rationality, not about logic. All these things get in the way. It's about emotions. And this is something that Hitler got uh, from one of the books that we know he actually read, uh, Psychologie de Foule, um, Psychology of the Masses, or Mass Psychology, by the French writer Gustave Le Bon. I'm sure you've seen these photographs, right? So um, this is Hitler practicing his body language, his gestures uh, in the photo studio of his private photographer Heinrich Hoffmann. And you can see him, one of the things he's trying to do there is getting angry. And uh, in the book I explore uh, in some detail where, all, where Hitler got this expertise from, uh, from whom he learned. Uh, I'm skipping that now. Uh, but I do want to point those of you who speak French to this particular documentary. Uh, it's called Le Charisme Politique. Um, uh, the, uh, the main title is Couper le son. Couper le son, of course, means turn off, turn, turn off the sound. Right? So what political consultants do nowadays paradoxically, 
If they want to find out if someone is a good speaker, if their client is a good speaker, they turn off the sound and they just watch the person. Right? Because, as it, as it says in this uh, uh, document, uh, documentary, uh, le visuel écrase tout. Right? The visual aspect crushes everything else. So, the superior speaker, of course, also needs a thorough understanding of what the media are, or is, saying. Have a read through this one. Not something that is well known about Hitler, I don't think, right? But he was incredibly well informed because his self-staging and his public speaking, his propaganda was the most important thing to him. And therefore he had to keep tabs on his image, also on the, what other people were thinking about him, what they were thinking about later on about the war, uh, and so on. Same is true of Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump has been accused of being lazy, watching five or six hours telefi television a day, which he does, helped by the fact that he only needs four or five hours sleep per day. Uh, but he does this not because he's lazy, but because of the propaganda value. And uh, it's not important what people say, Hitler says, it's important what is reported about what they say. And that's why, as a superior speaker, you need to work incredibly hard at your speeches, which is what Hitler did. So the trick is to come across as authentic, as speaking from the heart. But this was all prepared. The authenticity was artifice. Same, uh, I don't know whether you're looking skeptically or not, but <laughs> you can, but this is absolutely true. Um, people get skeptical when I say the same thing about Hitler, but this is so about Trump, but this is absolutely tr true of Trump. Uh, as well, but I'll skip the proof uh, for that. So this takes us to the um, rhetorical strategies that Hitler and Trump use. Jokes, insults and sexism. If we read through. Now again, reading a joke, you know, is not the same as hearing it. So it doesn't work particularly well as written text. Although I quite like the first one, I'm not sure whether the wordplay there is intentional or not. Numbers two and three are obviously shockingly sexist. Trump probably got this from Richard Nixon, who was president in the late 60s and early 70s, as you know, but who was already a politician in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, during the Red Scare, McCarthyism and all the rest of it, Nixon was running against a female opponent called Helen Gehagen Douglas. And uh, Nixon, as part of the Red Scare, tried to paint her as a communist. And he says, this woman, Helen Gehagen Douglas, she's a pinko, pink right down to her underwear. And in that sense, he literally exposed these women, right? And again, it's shocking, but for a certain type of audience, that works really well, because that's the thing we remember, right? We don't remember, sadly, discursive text, but do we, we do remember the jokes, we remember the visual aspect, and we remember extremism as well. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, just go back for a sec. So this, this is about Mathilde Ludendorff, the next one. I'll show it again in a moment. Mathilde Ludendorff, the second wife of First World War I General Erich Ludendorff. And Mathilde Ludendorff was the driving force behind the Tannenberg Bund, uh, the Tannenberg League, which was an extremist right-wing organization, a competitor of the Nazi party. Um, so Hitler then takes down Mathilde Ludendorff like this. We don't have the actual text, this is a description.
Now, this is a bit sad uh, because I don't have time for this, but um, if you write this down, you can Google this. Uh, not now, please. Um, so this is one of... Hitler, most of Hitler's jokes tend to be uh, sarcastic. This is a brilliant example of mocking humour where Hitler mocks uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt with a piece of basically absurdist theatre. I, I don't want to show it to you, I don't, I, I don't have time, but you, you, you can Google it. Um, so this is one of the problems, or another problem we have with Hitler, right? We now have the, finally, the 2016 uh, Kritische Edition of Mein Kampf, but we still don't have Hitler's speeches from start to finish. Okay, I'm going to uh, create some problems with the time for myself now. Um, but this is so part of the performative a a aspect, right? Um, so what we see, when we see the clips on YouTube, most of the clips aren't even on YouTube or get removed very quickly. We usually see maybe a couple of minutes, and that's basically, bless you, that's basically the end of the clip where Hitler ends up shouting, right? A Hitler speech was not like that at all. That was only the end. Hitler, first of all, would arrive late. He was never on time. 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late, an hour late, two hours late. Right? So the people were going crazy. He's coming, he's coming. No, he's not there yet. Oh, but now he's coming. And so on, right? Then Hitler starts, and one of the things that, thing that Hitler, again, not what we think of when we think of Hitler, uh, but one of the things that Hitler was really good at was silence. So the first public speech that Hitler gives after having been appointed Chancellor in 1933, uh, the first speech in front of a live audience. He stands in front of the audience and he just waits for a whole minute. For a whole minute he says nothing. Now you may think that a minute is not a very long time, but I can tell you That's 10 seconds. It feels like an eternity, right? And then he starts to speak, and he, Hitler would start to speak very, very slowly. You could almost not hear him. When you've given a presentation, when I've given a presentation, and you think you're losing your audience, I hope I'm not, um, then we tend to speak more quickly and more loudly, right? But what you should do, you shouldn't speak more loudly. What you should do, slow down, create some silence, and then people, what, what's he going to say, what's he going to say, right? In that time I could have shown the clip, I guess, but anyway, okay. What's this? Okay, I didn't really want to show this. Um, so forget the, the German quotation there. Uh, I only wanted to talk about the, the heading there, violence and strategic controversy. Both Trump and Hitler made sure that the newspapers afterwards would write about them and that people would remember this, that they would remember the speech. Now, as I said earlier, this is not to heighten the tension. Uh, as I said earlier, um, what I'm saying now, in four weeks' time, you will have forgotten 80% of it, and in um, six weeks' time, you will have forgotten all of it, Right? But if I take this chair and I throw it at Enrique and say, you stupid witch, or worse, that, I'm not going to do it, right? That you will remember all your life. And Hitler knew this and Trump knew this. So both of them made sure that their rallies were fireworks, also in terms of some sort of controversy. Right? You say something extremist, you make sure that a few people in the hall are carried out on stretchers, you send in the SA to beat up some people, that people will remember. Okay, coming back to the pragmalinguistics and the social linguistics, the rallies um, that Trump and Hitler had, they created entertainment, community, and individual empowerment. Now, I can see what, you can see what I'm trying to do here, right? I'm trying to reframe your understanding of what Nazi language, Hitler's language, is about and how it works. It doesn't really work on the level of words. 
It works as a total performance, a political Gesamtkunstwerk. Um, I apologize for the misspelling of Frederick Spots there. It's Frederick, not Frederick, as in Frederick Jameson. So people are having fun, right? Uh, and this also creates a sense of community. So there's a really good book on this by uh, a German theater director who's also a scholar called Bernd Stegemann. The book is called Das Gespenst des Populismus, The Spectre of Populism. And there, Stegemann talks about how populist meetings create a Gefühlsgemeinschaft, a community of feeling, where people are feeling in the same way. In the book, I try and explain this a little bit more by uh, talking about or discussing Hans-Ulrich Gumbrecht, Hans Gumbrecht's distinction between Präsenzkulturen and Sinnkulturen, presence cultures and meaning cultures. Um, okay. So that's also why, paradoxically, people in these mass meetings felt individually empowered. This is the opposite of what we are thinking when we're seeing them, right? We're seeing all these people shouting, greeting the Fuhrer, Heil Hitler, and all the rest of it, right? And we think these are, this is a mass, right? This is massification. This is uh, sheep obediently trotting behind the great Fuhrer, um, subjugate, voluntarily subjugating themselves to him. That is not how people in the mass perceive the meeting themselves, right? Think of Extinction Rebellion, the slogan of Extinction Rebellion, rebel together because together we are irresistible, right? So that sense of togetherness is individually empowering. Now, in the case of Extinction Rebellion, you don't have a Führer, right? So that can be seen as a good thing, it's a sort of good social movement. In the case of National Socialism, you have a comparable thing, but with a leader, with a Führer, right? And that makes it a bad movement. But for the people themselves, they feel empowered. They are thinking, I'm not on my own here, right? I can do, I'm not on my own here, there are other people who feel like me. And I can achieve something. Together we can achieve something. And Hitler was very much aware of this. Uh, here's the quotation again from Mein Kampf. It's quite surprising how Hitler reminds so openly about these things in my Kampf, but he does. I'll spare you the rest of the quotation which comes here, it's a bit too long. So this is uh, another uh, rhetorical strategy that I'm sure you're familiar with and that ling linguists are very good at analyzing simplicity, uh, repetition, and also interpretative openness, right? Simplicity and repetition uh, makes you, as a, as a popular speaker, makes you come across as authentic. You speak the language of your audience, not the language of the intellectuals. And you repeat things all the time, not just because then people won't forget it, but also because that's how we speak, right? We say, do you know what Johnny did? I'll tell you what Johnny did. Do you know what he did? I'll tell you what he did. What Johnny did, you won't believe this. What Johnny did, and so on and so forth, right? That's how we speak. And it comes across, because politicians normally don't do this, it comes across as authentic. So this is what uh, one of the... Uh, uh, American film moguls in the good old times uh, said the most important thing in the film business is honesty. Once you've learned to fake that, you're in. Right? And that's exactly what Hitler and Trump do as well. I'll come back to the interpretative openness in a moment. The language is emotive in nature. I talked about that earlier when I referred to Gustave Le Bon. But the Nazis also um, it wasn't just negative vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, there was also a positive vision, positive in the sense, uh, or in the eyes of the people at the time, there's also a positive vision of a harmonious, 
uh, meritocratic Volksgemeinschaft, as the Germans say, say, full of solidarity and all the rest of it. And the person who's analyzed that perhaps most convincingly is this one, the Jewish-German writer Ernst Bloch, uh, in a book called Erbschaft dieser Zeit, Heritage of Our Times. Not easy to read because Bloch has a fairly literary style. He's not an analytical philosopher, uh, but he's worth reading. The other key topic or strategy, rhetorical strategy, that again I'm sure you're familiar with, is extremism and exaggeration. Now, um, this is of course a well-known literary trope, right? We know it from satire, for example. We know it from medieval literature, where uh, on page one it would be said of Brunhilde, she was the most beautiful woman that ever lived, and then three pages further on, the text would say about Krimhild, there never was a woman more beautiful than her. Right? This is called the Einzigartigkeits uh, 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 topos, the uniqueness or singularity topos. Now, when we think of extremism and exaggeration, we think of populist, fascist, national socialist language, right? But actually, this is the way we speak. Right? So we say things like, I'm not wearing it now, this new watch, best decision ever. Right? It's, it's a bit sad if you know, choosing a watch is the best decision you've ever made. But that's what we say, right? You work as a barista, you say, but you know, my, my boss, my boss, this is horrible. He's worse than Stalin. Again, one would hope that that is not the case, but that is how we speak. Ordinary people. Well, you and I as well, right? So that then establishes a certain kind of rapport, even though, again, in linguistics, uh, we are much more likely to say, oh, this is typical of totalitarian uh, language. It is actually what the Italian political scientist uh, Marco Marini has called the language of the home, the language we speak at home with our family and friends. Right, so uh, this takes me to uh, the last few points uh, I want to make. Not too bad on the time. Because what I have not so far explored is the question of how the leaders follow us. Um, how they view his extremist statements and his excessive Promises. I'm saying he and his and so on because I'm thinking of Trump and Hitler, uh, but it can be people of any gender. So do the leaders' supporters actually believe th this stuff in a straightforward manner? Do they really fall for it? Or is there more to it? This, by the way, is one of the problems I have with uh, Victor Klemperer's uh, LTE, uh, because I think he does tend to s sort of underestimate the audience a little bit, in spite of all the brilliance of the book. So that question, how do the leaders follow as few his statements, that takes us to the question of narrative truth. And uh, it is first of all my uh, contention that the leaders follow us take him seriously, but not literally. So how are the leaders supporters able to take him literally? Uh, sorry, not literally, but nonetheless seriously. I think one of the ways in which they managed to do this is by interpreting his excessive, extremist and mendacious statements as what Scott Adams has called directionally accurate. So let's take the remarks that Trump, Donald Trump made about uh, Mexican immigrants in 2015-16 when he was running for president. Trump said uh, most of Mexican immigrants coming over the border are uh, criminals, rapists, uh, drug traffickers. Therefore I will build a big, uh, um, a big wall, a big stone wall between Mexico and the United States and Mexico will pay for the wall. 
But I don't think that this is... So that's what he literally said, but I don't think that that is what people heard. I don't think that that is what people understood that he was actually saying. And this is why empirical data, um, statistics and all the rest of it, uh, were never going to impact their view of what Trump was saying. What they believed, what they did believe, I think, what they heard, was that immigration is a serious problem, that this problem should be addressed, and that the existing political system is failing to do so. And a significant number of them were probably also biased uh, against Mexicans or non-white people generally. In other words, what they heard Trump expressing was not a series of facts or lies, but directional truth or inspirational truth. A statement that said, yes, you, my supporters, yes, you're right. There is a real problem here. No one's doing anything about it, but I will. Okay, and we have the same with Hitler. We we know this from testimony from Germans, including even National Socialists at the time, listening to Hitler in the 1920s and 30s, Uh, they would say things like, well, you know, uh, we thought that this stuff about the the Jews, you know, just, oh, you know, come on. Uh, uh, You know, a a leader of the masses on the make has got to say so many things, right? Or they would say, well, you know, we saw this as religious dogma. We didn't think that this was going to happen literally, right? So they thought, okay, there is a problem with the Jews, But they didn't think when Hitler talked about eliminating the Jews or getting rid of them, that he would then do what he actually (coughs) ended up doing, which is gassing them and burning them in ovens, to put it bluntly. Right? Um, So this is how that kind of rhetoric works. It's like advertising, and Hitler and Goebbels learned a lot from American advertising. If you want to sell something, a product or an idea, Don't contradict them, right? That's never going to work. Don't try and change their minds. But you have to, to use a German expression, man muss die Leute abholen, wo sie sind. Yeah, you've got to grab them where they are. So, in that sense, these speeches were always a two-way strategy, um, taken apart analytically, right? First of all, you say to your audience, yes, you're right. You're thinking that some Jews have too much power in Germany, you're absolutely right. Okay, that makes people feel good about themselves. And then, second stage, you take the audience way beyond them. You're thinking some Jews are a problem. But I'm telling you, all these Jews are a problem. You can never be really sure of them. Because they all have loyalties, ultimately, to das Judentum, rather than to Germany, rather than to the German soil. So it's not just the case that some Jews are a problem. All the Jews are a problem. In fact, the Jews are the problem. And when we deal with that problem, die Judenfrage, as the Nazi said, then everything will be hunky-dory. I've got a quite extensive analysis of this and the way conspiracy theories work in my, uh, uh, in my book. So the way it works is that consciously or uh, sorry, unconsciously or semi-consciously, the listeners translate these, uh, convert these extreme statements into something more palatable. Sometimes such a conversion process isn't even needed. uh, And this is the case when the leader makes statements that are just not particularly relevant to the audience. So the best example, I guess, is Trump's denial that he had an affair with a porn star, Stormy Daniels, and Trump's denial that he paid her off, right? Few, if any, of his supporters seem to have any um, uh, sort of any issues with that. No one thought that the veracity or otherwise of that statement was in any way uh, important. In the book, I explore that a little bit more by looking at the uh, distinction between hot cognition and cold cognition.
So, this takes us, finally, to what has come to be called truthiness. Uh, truthiness is a, coin, uh, is a term uh, coined by this guy here, Stephen Colbert, an American uh, comedian. Well, not coined by him, but certainly popularized by, by him. And I want to look, um, want to um, examine that by looking at an excerpt, a relatively short excerpt from Hitler's Mein Kampf. And the excerpt is about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion constitute a kind of master plan for Jewish world domination, supposedly hatched at a number of behind-the-scenes meetings during the first Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897. Now, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion are, of course, a forgery, right? The Congress was a real event, but there were no behind-the-scenes meetings, and hence no protocols, no minutes either. And, you know, there never was uh, a plan for Jewish world domination uh, anyway. So this is all known. Hitler knew, whilst he was writing Mein Kampf, because this was all known in the early 20s, and Hitler was writing Mein Kampf, Hitler knew that the protocols were uh, fake, a forgery. Yet for Hitler, this obvious forgery is still accurate. Its content still true. So how is that possible? Here's the explanation. I think it's... Yeah, okay. Comes in. Sorry for going. Yeah. Comes in two parts. So Hitler's text is not the most analytically precise, uh, but this is the core, really. So what Hitler is doing here is that he, he transposes the truth from the realm of historical fact to the realm of felt conviction. The empirical question of who composed the protocols, why and when, is seen as relating to mere surface phenomena, petty details in the face of an allegedly deeper reality, the truth, in inverted commas, that the Jews aspire to world domination. And that is exactly what truthiness is. It's gut truth, right? It's something that you feel to be true, regardless of the facts. And that takes me to the end of my lecture with four points I want to make uh, about truthiness. So first of all, truthiness involves interpretative openness. That is to say, different people can have different sort of different groups of people can have di different gut feelings, can have different gut truths, as it were. Right. So in the case of the protocols, it was entirely possible for anti-Semitic Germans to view the text as truthfully revealing the nature of, quote-unquote, the Jew. But there was considerable variation as to the contours and ramifications of this so-called Jewish asset, right? so, uh, essence. So some Germans believed, non-Jewish Germans, some Germans believed that the Jews aspired to full-blown world domination. Other Germans merely, in inverted commas, questioned the Jews' patriotism. Some Germans felt that the Jews had taken over the press or were about to do so. Other Germans merely, in inverted commas, felt that there were too many Jewish journalists. Right, so again, you have a sort of bandbreite, a range of possible interpretations of this which accommodates different groups with different levels of 
anti-Semitic belief. That takes me to the second point. Truthiness is a group phenomenon, right? If um, If I'm the only one who's feeling this, then my gut truth is basically at best an idiosyncrasy and at worst, at worst a sign of mental illness, right? But if other people feel like me, then I can, then I can believe it as well. So truthiness is based on commonality of belief. It's a group phenomenon. It's not simply I feel it to be true. It is we feel it to be true. So let's look at an example. Let's do Trump. It's a bit quicker. We just had Hitler. Um, so Trump said that he won the uh, 2020 election and not Joe Biden, which obviously is a lie. And a lot of Trump supporters say they believe this. You, know, you look at all these polls and so on, the majority of Republicans certainly believe this. So does this mean that Trump supporters are completely blind to empirical reality? Are they really that dull-witted? I don't think that is plausible. Rather, I think what happens here is two things. First, Trump's false claim about vote numbers is unconsciously or semi-consciously translated into a statement about the election's fairness. Right? This is the deliteralization I talked about earlier. We don't take him literally. But what Trump is really saying here is that the election wasn't fair. And this statement, that the election was rigged, that feels true to many Americans. So what is arguably Trump's biggest lie comes to be experienced as true because it dovetails with the narrative, the overarching narrative that many people in America have of the country being in the tentacles of a power-hungry liberal elite. In other words, Trump may not have received more votes, mathematically, than Biden. And even his supporters may think that, on, may acknowledge that on some level, but that's not what matters to him, to them. Sorry. What matters is that, quote-unquote, the deck was stacked against Trump, what with all the liberal media and so on. And in that, quote-unquote, deeper sense, <coughs> Trump's statement about having won the election is, quote-unquote, true. So it's part of an overarching narrative. In my last point, I will come back to that in a little bit more detail. <coughs> now, truthiness, like conspiracy theories, by the way, take, um, uh, truthiness takes archetypal forms. It's a tale of good against evil, heroes against villains, rebels against the establishment. The plot is one of continuous challenges and tasks to be accomplished, of persecution and resistance, of struggle and victory, or undeserved defeat. In other words, it's a fairy tale structure, right? Uh, and also, by the way, the structure of pretty much all popular fiction. And this is the, almost the default position, hence the, type, the term archetypal, this is the mind's default position. We tend to think in these black and white categories, especially when the world is frightening, right? Because of globalization, automation, because we've lost our job, because of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, because of the Wall Street crash of 1929, whatever it may be, right? We have the feeling... Uh, to quote the Communist Manifesto, that uh, some people have the feeling that all that is solid is melting into air. And then you need terra firma. You need something you can hold on to. And then you go man, woman, wrong, right, um, hero, villain, right? Because that's much more 
um, reassuring than saying, oh, there are multiple uh, genders, or much more reassuring than saying the color of truth uh, is gray, uh, and so on. So the more hostile and frightening and unjust the world appears to us, as I think it did to many Germans after the Treaty of Versailles and the defeat in World War I, and then even more so after the Wall Street crash of 1929, and as it does to many Trump supporters now, because of globalization and automation and all the rest of it, uh, Black Lives Matter and all the, and the, um, um, uh, the Me Too movement and so on, all these movements that we, I hope anyway, consider to be positive, right? For many people, that is actually frightening, the undermining of all these old quasi-certainties. Um, and the more hostile and frightening and unjust the world appears to us, the more likely we are to embrace fairy tales, right? This is the reason children like fairy tales, because they're reassuring. So, last point. Not too, too bad on the time. Um, people assess the validity of a story not by confronting it with the facts, but by comparing it to other stories. This is something that Enrique and I were talking about uh, earlier, right? So is climate change a reality? I, for one, am not in a, in a position to establish this empirically. I believe climate change is real because my view, my story of the society that I live in, includes a significant amount of trust in science and in the scientific community. But if such trust breaks down, even the most basic facts will come to be questioned and people will start casting about for a different explanatory framework. That is to say, for a story that will give new meaning to the old facts, explain the old facts away, or make the old facts seem irrelevant. And as I hinted a moment ago, I think it is precisely such a breakdown in social trust within their respective societies that Trump, and obviously in a much more extreme fashion, Hitler, managed to exploit. Thank you for your attention. And you have five minutes to tell the anecdotes which you cut at the beginning. Right, okay, so um, two anecdotes about um, Hitler's self-control. 1930, if you want to go, go. Uh, you'll miss the, the, probably the, 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 the thing that the others will remember, but that's fine, it's fine, don't worry. Don't feel embarrassed, so I'm just joking, <laughs> because I know that, I know that makes people, okay. Um, so 1938, right? Um, Hitler, as we know, was born in Austria, but initially he didn't want to invade Austria. He thought these are basically, Germany and Austria, basically one country anyway, uh, so they're going to grow together. However, for that to happen, Hitler thought a number of things had to take place in Austria, including the appointment of Zeiss Inquart, Arthur Zeiss Inquart, as interior minister. Um, so Hitler then invites the Austrian Chancellor. Should, okay, I'm, I was. Yeah. No, 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 I'm okay. Um, Hitler then in, invites um, uh, the Austrian Chancellor Kurt Schusnick over to the Berghof, um, his holiday retreat or second seat of government uh, in the Bavarian Alps. And the first thing Hitler does is that he makes sure that the reception committee includes a number of particularly fierce-looking German generals. Uh, and a number of Nazis, uh, Austrian Nazis, whom Schwarzenegger had prosecuted. They go then to the first floor of the Berghof, where Hitler's study was, <coughs> and Hitler immediately tears into Schwarzenegger, saying, you know, You've got to, why, why are you resisting this? You've got to appoint Zeisingquart. And so Hitler goes on and on, one of his famous monologues, and then suddenly Hitler completely explodes. His face goes all red. And I'm not very good at Hitler imitation. Right? I want to talk to General Keitel right now! And Keitel, who's downstairs, immediately rushes up the stairs. What can I do for you, my Fuhrer? And Hitler, we're going to we're going to talk about Austria! They go into the other room. Hitler goes in first. Keitel goes in second, closes the door behind him. And he sees Hitler then sitting on the chair, completely relaxed, saying, Keitel, what do you think about the weather today? 
They talk, by the way, for tiny 10 minutes. Hitler, perfectly calm, perfectly relaxed. He goes back into the room with Schrusnik. Hitler does. And he said, oh, I have now spoken to Kaiser. So this was all fake. It was all the show. And Hitler did this all the time. He knew exactly what to, what to do, right? So some people then, if they want to achieve something, maybe they start crying deliberately. Or they get angry. And Hitler tended to get angry. Although he's also very, very good at turn, turning on the uh, charm. Okay, that's the Hitler anecdote. Got one on Trump as well. Um, so I can show you the picture actually. Yeah, so here we see Schusnick. Uh, there to the left, Kaiser to the right, Berghoff on top. Okay. Trump interviews um, uh, Jason Miller, who was applied as communications director. And Jason Miller, before that, had worked for Texas Senator Ted Cruz. So uh, Miller then resigns and, and, and applies for this position uh, with Trump. So there's the interview panel, a number of people sitting around, uh, Trump, Trump is there, and the first thing that uh, Trump says is, um, okay, so you, you've come over from Trump, from um, Cruz, haven't you, uh, Jason? Um, you, I guess you want to join the winning team. Now, before I can appoint you, I, I have to know something. Um, you have to tell me some dirt about Ted Cruz, because te Ted Cruz is still running as presidential candidate. I need some dirt on Ted Cruz. Um, and Jason Miller said, I, I can't do that, that's my former boss. Oh, come on, Trump says, of course you can. Give me some dirt on Ted Cruz. Miller uh, refuses. Two or three more rounds of this, and then Trump suddenly turns angry. I apologize for using the F word now. And he said, look, I'm not fucking around. And his face goes all red, he explodes. I'm not fucking around anymore. Give me some dirt on Cruz or you're out of here. Okay, that's more Robert De Niro than Donald Trump. But, um, so the assembled cast is wearing concerned looks. Jason Miller is thinking um, Trump is now going to call security to have me removed. Trump is just staring at Miller for five seconds. And then Trump breaks into this big grin and says, that's the right answer. Because if you had betrayed Cruz, I know you would have betrayed me as well. Again, a complete act. And Hitler did this thing all the time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks for staying for the uh, course of the paper four. Um, for finalists, there will be some revision sessions uh, in Trinity term. Um, this, as all the other lectures, will go up on the playlist for paper four. Have a look also uh, at uh, previous lectures because this term we very much looked into additional kind of resources branching out to um, up to uh, uh, current times. So look at Geraldine Horan's uh, lecture on LTE and uh, broaden that out. But I, I think it was brilliant, uh, thanks a lot, uh, to, to get this wider perspective and to take communication away just from the written word into the whole staging. And as a medievalist, it's a point I always uh, say, uh, we have to uh, reimagine the staging of medieval texts. They are for performance. They aren't to be read um, silently. So thanks a lot for that. <laughs> Thank you for coming.